she had would have a party at the, uh, the the presidential palace, and they would be in one room that was uh, air conditioned, but really chilled, so that the women could wear their fur coats. You know, this is in a tropical island. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to my channel, Linani of Barbados. Today we are here to discuss a woman that Meghan Markle wishes she could be. The Princess of Haiti, Michelle Duvalier. Yes, I saw your comments and I was so pleased that a lot of you wanted to know about this princess that I referenced in my last video. I mean, this just shows me that we really are a community. We really have the same interests. If Meghan Markle had class, if Meghan Markle had a brain, if Meghan Markle had style, she could be something like Michelle Duvalier. Maybe, maybe not. In this video, you're probably gonna notice some comparisons. Please feel free to put down in the comments what you think is different between the two women and what you think is quite similar. Okay, let's go on our deep dive. Buckle up. <laughs> Michelle Bennett was born in 1950. Sorry, according to this wristband, she was born in 1951, and I'm not the kind of gal to add any amount of age to a beautiful woman. Michelle is a very public person, so she puts everything out here on the internet, so do not come for me. Thank you. She comes from a very wealthy, prominent family in Haiti. Her father is a descendant of King Henri Christophe I of Haiti. King Henri was Michelle's great, great, great grandfather. Her mother was also from a very good family, so Michelle's uncle on her mom's side was Haiti's Roman Catholic Archbishop Monsignor Francois Wolf Ligonde. Michelle is giving well-bred. Her father owned anywhere from 50 to 100,000 acres of land in Haiti. I'm seeing different reports, but he at all times employed 1,500 people. He was in the coffee business. So already you can see some differences between Michelle and Megan in that Michelle was used to class. She was used to wealth and she came from somewhere, as they would say. But what really fascinates me about Michelle, and I'm so fascinated with her, I've been fascinated with her for a long time, is that she's so charismatic. She's so beautiful. The inside joy just comes out of her. She's clearly having a wonderful time. She's clearly happy. And I don't mean grinning teeth that look like they want to bite you. She's definitely really happy when she's happy. But then it also seems like she knows when to tone it down. We should, uh... And be very gracious and have that humility that some people we know lack. Okay, I'm gonna stop comparing already because you guys can do it yourselves, okay? But she knows when to be serious, when to be measured, when to be humble. She's got it all. And I know I'm gushing, but she has an amazing sense of style too. What I really appreciate about her style is that she knows how to mix the Caribbean style with the Parisian chic. And she does it so beautifully. And she has amazing body. She looks like a model. She has beautiful hair, beautiful eyes. Nobody stood a chance, really. And gush over. So in 1980, Michelle marries the dictator Jean-Claude Duvalier, otherwise known as Baby Doc. His father was a dictator who changed the constitution by referendum to make himself dictator for life. There was no opposition to this referendum because it was rigged and he was a murderous tyrant. Also changed the Lord's Prayer that would be said in schools and in churches in Haiti, a Roman Catholic country. The Lord's Prayer was changed to Our Doc who art in the National Palace for Life, hallowed be thy name by present and future generations there will be done in port-au-prince as it is in the provinces amen it's giving kim jong-ul megalomaniac literally baby doc is the polar opposite of his father he's meek he's mild he's very soft-spoken people had difficulty even like hearing him speak Yo, merci en pile. And it seems almost like he had a bit of a speech impediment or something. And so he, and I'm not being ableist. I had a lisp when I was a child too, girl. I was like talking like this all time. Okay, so whatever, when I was this all. But I worked through it and here we are today. So <laughs> thank you, thank you. Back to them. <laughs> Baby Doc, a lot of people thought he didn't particularly want the position of being dictator and front and center. Some people thought he wasn't ready for it as well. As he was just 19 when he took over the role as president for life. When Michelle comes on the scene, she was like, oh. <laughs> This man is made for me because she's ready for this role. Michelle Duvalier in five years brought down the entire country of Haiti. And I'm jumping ahead, but I just want to put things in numbers so that you understand what we're going to discuss here. After that five years, Michelle left Haiti with $800 million, which in today's money is $1,300,000,000 that 
she left Haiti with in 1986. Michelle Duvalier left this treasury in Haiti with $500,000. John Glenn and Michelle Bennett, take our money in Haiti. You have to give the money, money back. back. I don't know about you, but 1 billion 300 million is giving me better than a Netflix deal. Is giving me better than a Spotify deal. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I can't help myself. Focus, Leilani. Okay, so let's talk about this wedding though. <laughs> June 5th, 1980, in a ceremony so lavish that the Guinness Book of Records lists it as one of the three most expensive weddings, Haiti's 28-year-old president for life, Jean-Claude Duvalier, marries Michelle Bennett, a divorcee and mother of two. The wedding cost in those times of 1980, three to five million dollars, which in today's money is $11 million. We're talking about in Haiti. Yes, the wedding was in Haiti. Although a lot of the things were flown in from other countries, like the floral arrangements were flown in from Miami, Florida, USA. It was a lot. This is where we first see Michelle Duvalier's intellect, her brain. This is a woman who went to very good schools. She was very well educated. And she immediately recognized that she should live stream her whole life we would say vlogging in today's time and so her wedding was the first time that she decided that the media was going to be her specialty social media if you will and she put these televisions in every part of haiti shown in squares like this across the country on tvs which the first lady had had installed all throughout the streets she lined the streets with televisions they had to be put in cages because we're going to get into how poor haiti was but people didn't really have televisions and so you had to put them in these cages to secure them that's in the hair there what's really interesting is that she made the police make the people sit down and watch her wedding they had to sit and watch it narcissism anyone <laughs> listen before you start to judge Michelle, understand that Michelle entered into a marriage with a man who controlled a country that had been corrupt forever, okay? So the fact that she took the reins and threw in some media and some fashion and some stuff into the mix-up, you know, what is a girl supposed to do? Really? We can't be so hard on her when she was entering into corruption. Do you know what I mean? So anyway, all the people had to sit down and watch her wedding. Otherwise, they'd be thrown in jail. Funny enough, they actually liked it. They actually sat and watched this wedding under duress and found that they loved it. Is it a Stockholm Syndrome? We don't know. To most Haitians watching on television, it was enchanting. A storybook wedding of a king and a queen. They liked her. They liked the queen. They wanted the queen. They had a queen. Is that the way she saw herself as a queen? I don't think she saw herself as anything less than that. Bernard Saint-Journet, one of Haiti's leading painters, was a favorite artist and frequent dinner guest of Baby Doc and Michelle. And she suited the role because her, she was the first person in those 30 years to understand that show business was the name of the business and her show business was very well done. Yeah, Prince Charles and Princess Diana. This was their royal wedding and this was their princess. And all of the beauty that came up to the total of $3 million in those times, they believed in it. You know, they had been under Papa Doc's rule before and they were very oppressed people. And this to them signaled a new lease on life, a new story, a new storybook that they could be part of. And they fell for it, 100%. This scene came to symbolize the blind arrogance of Baby Doc and Michelle's regime. The dictator hurling small change to the poor, while he and his wife extorted hundreds of millions. They didn't think about their problems. They were living vicariously through Michelle. What got even better is that these TVs that were installed were not just put there. I mean, she didn't just do one video and quit YouTube, girl. She started her own foundation. It was called the Michelle Bennett Duvalier Archwell Foundation. I'm sorry. It was called the Michelle Bennett Duvalier Foundation. <laughs> And this is where, if you cared to, you could send money to after you have seen her up and down doing charity work. And to solicit contributions for her Michelle Bennett Duvalier Foundation. Every day, the elegant first lady was featured in scenes like this, launching vaccination campaigns, touring hospitals, giving her heart to the people. But what about the first lady's foundation? 
and the millions of dollars she had raised on behalf of the poor. That was Joseph Calder. Joseph Calder. Was she taking a lot of money out of it, you think? Oh, yes, yes. I believe that was a very important source of income for her. But she's there with them, and they loved her. They loved her being there. <laughs> Of course, this footage is being disseminated throughout the world and people are starting to catch on that there is this angel, literal angel in Haiti helping the poor people and money starts to flow. Money starts coming into Haiti like crazy and it's all going into her foundation. International press, all of it. Supplies start coming in like crazy. Food starts getting sent in like crazy. You know, it's hard for some people, you know, because when you're a girl boss, it's very difficult to separate business from, I guess, charity. Even U.S. aid shipments were often diverted and sold for profit in the marketplace. By the time of his marriage to Michelle, Baby Doc is said to have amassed a fortune of hundreds of millions of dollars. It's very difficult when you have such a good business mind to not sell the supplies that come in on the streets in the market and collect the profits from that. Her father was given the position of the head of import-export in Haiti, so he controlled all of that there too. She had a very close-knit family. Everybody came out licking, as we would say in Barbados. Everybody came out with something. Her brothers were given things. I believe there was one brother, in fact, that had control of Air Haiti, the airline for Haiti, in that he could import and export contraband and things like that as he wanted to. And that's not an accusation. He was actually arrested in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And of course, they extradited him back to Haiti, where he was fine yeah walk free i appreciate that with her that she looked out for her family yes she did get rid of his family she took over literally this country and within one year she had kicked out of the palace jean claude's mother all of jean claude's mother's relatives 98 of them were exiled so she literally went after the the the, the duvaliers with a with a vengeance i mean to to literally exert her power. Of course, after being seen as this amazing saintly figure, Mother Teresa pops in to Haiti. And Mother Teresa says to Michelle something that Mother Teresa has never said to anybody in the history of Mother Teresa being Mother Teresa. I have seen many people coming, and kings and people, presidents and prime ministers, but I have never seen the poor people being so familiar with their heads of state as they were with her. It was a beautiful lesson for me. I have learned something from you. So, thank you. She, Mother Teresa, has learned something from Michelle. Mother Teresa, girl, if you don't take your check and go home. When the Pope now came after Mother Teresa, he was like, oh, hell no. <laughs> Sorry, but he was. He was like... The Pope's visit in March 1983 as the first challenge to Baby Doc and Michelle. The Pope was going beyond the Duvaliers, standing by him, and telling the Haitian people, I don't agree with what they're doing. We cannot have this scandalous wealth side by side with the abject poverty. Things have got to change. And from that speech of the Pope, uh, the message went out that uh, the Duvalier regime could no longer continue the way it was continued, it was doing business. And she does take it well on board. She does cut taxes by 10% in order to show the Pope and the rest of the world, lest they speak badly on her, that, um, that she's doing something to make a difference in the people's lives. I know you heard the blueberry, so I'm just saying hi. <sighs> okay, you happy now? Michelle Duvalier, as I said before, entered a marriage with a man who was a dictator in a corrupt government. Baby Doc, her husband, did not really trust the army of Haiti. There was a lot of people he didn't trust. He didn't trust the police. His father was an extremely paranoid man, as it was, and started this Tonton Makut, which is a private army, a private militia that protected them and served them. And this Tonton Makut 
they would basically take down anyone who opposed them. So if Michelle said something and somebody didn't like it, the Tonto Maku would simply go to the house of the person who opposes her and have a nice decent conversation with them and then they would probably get taken out on a nice ride on a yacht out to sea and then they would never come back again. But that, I mean, that has nothing to do with her. They decided to go and have a think about, you know, what they, what they said about her and they just never returned, you know, that's what it was. Needless to say, Michelle completely dominated cabinet meetings. In the cabinet meeting? Oh, well, she insert anybody at any time. Nobody could resist her. Were people afraid of her? I beg your pardon. She was, she frightened everybody. And people avoided her because, try to avoid her, because if she does not get what she wants, she would cry, she would try to break everything, she was hysterical, she will go ex hysterical. Just to give an example of how she can dominate a conversation, this is an interview that she gave. And just to give you some context, the interviewer is trying to tell her, Madame Duvalier, please could you speak in Creole, which is the colloquial language of bastardized French. The masses speak Creole. And the interviewer is saying, please say this in Creole so that the people understand you. And she refuses to comply. She only will speak in high French, Francais. Well, let's get to my favorite part. The spending. <laughs> Evita Peron, hi girl, I see you. Imelda Marcus, hi girl, I see you. <laughs> but when it comes to Michelle, let's just get straight to the furs. I know we want to talk about the furs. Michelle Duvalier used to go to Paris all the time shopping, using the treasury's money, of course. I think that the average Haitian person gets paid $150 a year. Michelle and her husband spent tens of millions per year on themselves spending. But girl, when I tell you she went to Paris and spent. Michelle and an entourage of 14 set off on a fateful shopping trip to Paris. And for the first time, people got very angry because Michelle to Paris were weak with 14 friends of hers and then she called her bank you know as you do which was the central bank of Haiti is the name of her bank and was like can you please wire over another million and of course I couldn't tell her no and I've just discussed why so they did wire over another million and she only spent 700,000. So, I mean, that was a good result. Very good. Only 700,000. So in all, she spent $1.7 million. She bought all these refrigeration devices and put them in a room to keep her furs. But then she also decided to refrigerate a wing of the palace so that she could have all of these friends that also bought furs over to parties in which they would wear furs in the heat of Caribbean Haiti. I did mention that she's the world's first in real life vlogger and she filmed her coming back from these shopping sprees bringing back all her stuff her accoutrement the people had to watch that on these same tvs that i was telling you about they had to then watch all the parties that she was holding one of which was the undoing of michelle duval what the people of haiti saw in may of 1984 was this lavish benefit ball which michelle had organized on behalf of the poor $500 a plate. Oh, I think I have it written down here. It's $2,000 in today's money, a plate. Haiti snapped. The first lady, she's a bum. Michelle Menez, she's a prostitute. She make vodou to take jumble, and all the time she take marijuana. Spending money, millions and millions of dollars. Michelle Bernard, That's what she meant. everybody called her is a lesbian. She was a dead. lesbian. She no, tried to, to eat all the little children. children. For sacrifice. Okay. That's what she meant. By sacrifice. Remember, by this point, they've been 30 years under dictatorship. A lot of them are brainwashed. There's an issue with illiteracy in Haiti. That makes it a little bit easier to brainwash the people. It takes a little bit longer for people to get information that they can digest when all they're seeing is a television saying you have this saint woman running the country. It takes a bit longer when there's an illiteracy problem, when there's a language problem, as I said, between Creole and French. French, Creole, house, uh, maison, caille. Plate. Assiette. Assiette. Air conditioner. La clim. Air conditionné. Air conditionné. Tree. Uh, L'arbre. Pied bois. Pied. Pied. Bois. Bois. Pied et le bois. They finally say, okay, we get it. We got it. Our eyes can see what our eyes can see. And this is ridiculous. You have a revolt. Throughout the country, chants and lurid songs about Michelle's sex life rang out on the streets. 
Graffiti and crude drawings appeared on walls. The Duvaliers start to get a little bit anxious. Uh, they start to hold up in their palace as all of these riots are going on in the streets. And everyone is sort of expecting them to leave. But Michelle comes out here in her car. <laughs> we are still here. A girl's not leaving. <laughs> A girl's not finished spending. <laughs> like, it gets better. Don't worry. On the inside, Michelle knew that her life was in danger. In Haiti, people's anger was reduced to acts of symbolic vengeance. But in New York, Michelle's brother was attacked in the streets. And in Paris, the Duvalier's financial advisor was beaten and hospitalized. They were reaching out to all parts of the world to seek asylum in. Question is, why is Haiti so poor? Haiti was the breadbasket of the Caribbean, France's highest earning colony before the revolt happened. Haitians revolted against the French from 1791 to 1804, and although they won, a lot was destroyed, and France basically sued Haiti from damages, and in 1825, Haiti had to pay France 100 million francs for its losses. Okay, so you get the picture. It was very difficult for Haiti to get it back on its feet. Shout out to Andrew Holness, who wants reparations for Jamaica. Life could have been much worse if you had to pay England for the destruction of the plantations and so on and so forth. I'm thinking reparations because in my last video, I did talk about Prime Minister Andrew Holness of Jamaica seeking reparations from the UK. Andrew, it could be worse. You could have had to pay the UK like Haiti had to pay France. <laughs> It could be worse. Sorry. So in 1986, Jean-Claude Baby Doc Duvalier and Michel Bennett Duvalier and their children leave Haiti to eventually France, which said they would temporarily house them. And then unexpectedly, just before dawn on the 7th of February, the 29-year-old Duvalier dynasty came to a close. Baby Doc and Michel drove through a gauntlet of newsmen to a waiting U.S. Air Force jet that flew them to exile in France. They had managed to get an estimated $800 million out of the country, leaving behind less than 500000 in the treasury. Eventually, Haiti decided that they wanted to indict them. You get indicted over nothing? And the Haitian government appeals to France to say, please, can we start a trial for them in France? And France says, sorry, but it's not our problem. That is not our jurisdiction. And you have to somehow get them back to Haiti and do the case in Haiti instead in your courts, in Haitian courts. But during the investigation, they did find uh, Michel Duvalier flushing documents down the toilet and those documents included her latest spendings $168,780 in Givenchy clothing $272,200 in Bouchon jewelry over $9,752 for two children horse saddles from Hermes well I mean I think that's a good result because she actually has four children so it could have been worse in 1987 just one year after they left Haiti the case was dismissed in France and we don't hear anything more from them until 1990 when Jean-Claude Duvalier decides he's had enough of this charade and he wants a divorce. He's accusing Michelle, his wife, of committing immoral acts. <laughs> Ethel is calling the pot black. Because he didn't commit any immoral acts, surely. If he did nothing wrong, she did nothing wrong. Anyway, he finds his way in the Dominican Republic, which is the country adjacent to Haiti. And also, I have heard throughout the years, very easy to get a quick divorce in the Dominican Republic. I don't know what it is. I haven't looked into it. But there's something about the DR that people go there to get really quick divorces. And so Baby Doc goes down to the Dominican Republic to get his divorce and gets it. But Michelle Duvalier follows him down there, girl. For some reason, she wanted to stay married to Jean-Claude Duvalier. And why say for some reason she was actually living with another gentleman in Cannes France by then so I'm not sure why she just did not let this man go the divorce was granted to Jean-Claude Duvalier baby doc and he had to pay alimony and child support so you know in 2010, Michelle Duvalier returns to Haiti because of the earthquake. And she comes there to help the people of Haiti. She says she feels in her heart so much for them. One of her brothers, sadly, was lost in the earthquake. And so, yes, she was there for that too. But boots on the ground, doing what she does best. And guess what? Nobody tried to unalive her. 
People, again, in Haiti either have very short memories or they're very easily conditioned. I'm not sure what it is, but they were so happy that their princess, Michelle Duvalier, had come back to save them and help them from this earthquake. I mean, Haiti was really hitting rock bottom, for lack of a better term. But so was Baby Doc, dictator husband of Michelle. You know, a lot of their accounts were frozen throughout the years as people cottoned on to like what they were doing and what they were up to and how much had happened and how much had been stolen. And it is alleged that Baby Doc returned to Haiti in 2011 because he needed some money. Baby Doc's friend was now in power in Haiti and so Baby Doc was very much protected and somehow well received when he went back to Haiti in 2011. But unfortunately, there were some Haitians that still wanted him to be tried for his crimes. And so the court case was revived in Haiti against Baby Doc. Unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, he passed away. He died of a heart attack before he was able to stand trial. Yeah. But speaking of being accepted back into Haiti, Michel Duvalier's son is actually an up and coming politician in Haiti. He looks kind of like a carbon copy of his father. And the people really love him. He's very well spoken. He's different from his father. He's not soft spoken. He's very clever. And he's down there starting to prepare to run for office in Haiti as well. His momager is Michelle. Yes, of course. She is very much in favor of her son, Nicolas Duvalier, becoming. <laughs> I guess president for life of Haiti. And I'm sure you will see her return right back to that palace and her air conditioned facilities uh, if that were to happen. But yeah, she's definitely his momager. I mean, Kris Jenner has nothing on her. She is out here politicking about him and saying how wonderful he is. And I'm sure he, I'm sure he is wonderful. Go pile jeune talent, Jodia. Mais moi-même personnellement, mon petit Jean old school en ce qui s'agit de de la musique. But back to Michelle for a moment. She lives a wonderful life in Paris. She's got amazing taste. She has a beautiful apartment. She has the most amazing Christmas tree at Christmas time. She is chic as ever. You can look at this picture of her here walking. I can recognize that she has a Hermes Birkin bag that she's carrying there. Her life is wonderful. She goes on a lot of vacations all over Europe. What is really interesting is that no other corrupt person was able to finesse the way that she finessed. I think in history, Michelle Duvalier will be the woman that Meghan Markle wishes that she was. Anyway, I had a lot of fun making this video and I hope you enjoyed it. And please give a thumbs up if you did like it. And yeah, I will see you in the refrigeration wing of the palace at the next party. Love you. Bye. Mm -hmm. oh. Bye. Don't forget to subscribe to my son's children's channel. The link is in the description. Thank you.